airflow is one of those conversations that I can tell you the nerdiest process, the most insane way of validating airflow that you'll never actually do, uh, and it still would only be just scratching the surface. Like airflow is one of the most complicated, like the measurement of airflow, all that is one of the most complicated topics there are. Um, so I'm going to start by keeping it pretty basic, uh, and then we're going to get into it a little bit more in depth. Matt's going to do some on fan laws and some of that stuff. Again, I'm not going to expect you to memorize formulas. Uh, if we show you formulas, it will be for the benefit of you understanding how it works, not for you having to do math, right? And if we do make you do math, you'll do it on my app where it's free and you can do it anytime you need to, right? Um, easily without having to actually do the math. But airflow before charging is very true, right? And I don't want people messing with, and that does not mean you need to know the exact CFM production number, but it does mean that you need to have a very solid um, understanding or solid belief that you have proper airflow before you start putting gas in the system. Um, and on a new system, that's very important. So from a practical standpoint, what does that look like? It looks like do a basic assessment of the ducts that you're connecting to to the filter that you're connecting to. Does this duct work from a very visual, you guys have, those of you who have done this for any amount of time, you know what's normal and what's not normal. And if you're connecting to something, it's like, that return duct looks too small. I can almost guarantee you it's too small, right? Uh, without having to do any fancy math or anything else. So just start there with the basic, take responsibility for if you're about to connect to something and it doesn't look right, say something. Um, because you don't want to put in a brand new system on poor ductwork, it causes all kinds of problems. So that's, that's basics, 101. The next thing that I want you to really pay attention to is how you set up your air handlers and controllers. Right? Make sure that you're doing that correctly. Um, with modern communicating equipment, a lot of that is done at the controller, you know, just making sure that's set up properly. Um, do you guys do a lot of setting up of dehumidification controls, that kind of stuff? Do you work with like a lot of... Uh, I give an example, variable speed air handler with 24 volt thermostat type of setup. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so if you're doing, so you'll have like a D, a DHUM, a DH, that type of terminal and you actually have to wire that to the thermostat. Do you do that very often? No. I'm getting a lot of blank faces. Okay. Okay, but I'm saying with 24 volt type air handlers where you're not doing a communicating control, like an like a, like a Ecobee thermostat, a Nest thermostat, whatever, where you actually have a DH terminal, anything like that? No, you don't run into that very often. Okay, all right. So that's, that's a good one because that's uh, one that a lot of people mess up where the system is operating in dehumidification mode all the time, ramping down the blower. In some cases, people will land the Y wire on the wrong terminal, which results in half speed blower, that kind of stuff. So it's important that you know how to set up the equipment that you're working on and that it produces the right airflow. Beyond that, Static pressure is the easiest way to kind of just assess, right? But it's important that you do those other things first because if you don't have the system set up to produce the right airflow to begin with, so it, say it's, making, it's producing half the airflow it should produce, your static pressure is going to look great, right? Your static pressure only tells you anything if the system is producing the airflow it's supposed to produce. Does that make sense? If it's not making the right amount of airflow, then your static pressure is going to be low if, you, if it's not making enough airflow. Does that make sense at all? Okay, good. So it's important that we get those things set up first. After that, you are just putting static pressure probes in, but putting them in the right place is also important. Now, in, our, in your market, you're working on air handlers almost exclusively. You guys never work on furnaces, do you? No furnaces. Great, because furnaces are a pain in the butt to measure static pressure on. Everything in the box, everything that comes shipped in the box is contained in the static pressure reading for that system. So when you look at that data tag and it shows that design static or that max design static and it's 0.5 or 0.3 or 0.8 or whatever it is. Nowadays, almost everything's coming as 0.5, I think now. You see 0.3 still? I think it's a little bit older. I think all the modern SEER 2 equipment has to be 0.5. Um, I don't know. So you need to make sure that you, as much as you can, keep your total external static, meaning the static pressure external to the system, within that range. But keep in mind, that's a new construction. That's, that's a new install. If your evaporator coil gets dirty, your blower wheel gets dirty, your filter inside the unit gets dirty, dirtier than it should be, then all bets are off because now that adds to that external static. Right? So 
We're saying external with a perfectly clean box. Perfectly clean evaporator coil, perfectly clean blower, everything else. So let's say you have that, that uh, carrier control there that you're showing. And it shows you your static pressure, right? What's that? Oh, it's a Brian Evolution. Sorry. Brian Evolution. Same thing. But same thing I have in my house, right? Same controller. Bryant, yes. Um, whatever that says on that display is actually not total external static. I'm going to give a second for you guys to think about that. What that says on that display, even though the display says total external static, TESP, is not actually total external static. Why? The, 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 actual, the actual display, your evolution display, is measuring static pressure. How is it measuring it? It's just, not just measuring at the blower. At the blower. There you go. You don't have enough blower. Well, it's, it's, but it is measuring it at the blower. So if you have a dirty evaporator coil, that's also factoring in. So it's actually measuring total static, not total external static. Total external static means return in supply. right? That's measuring at the blower. So that takes into account evaporator coil, everything else, right? And so if your evap coil gets dirtier, the, the, that blower doesn't know where the restriction's coming from. It just knows there is one, right? It's showing it from the blower. That makes sense? So that's why a lot of times if you're looking at a control like that, you can actually, if you, if you baseline that, so you, keep, you, you log that information, and then you go back a year later, two years later, three years later, and you can look at the change, that can tell you, is my evaporator coil getting dirty? Is my blower wheel potentially uh, getting clogged up? That kind of stuff. Make sense? Yeah. So keep that in mind. Static is tricky. It's all about where you measure to. So it's really, really important where you put the probes is the point. And so you can do neat things. Like you can actually look at what the pressure drop across the filter is by putting one probe underneath, one above. You can show the coil pressure drop below the coil, above the coil. You can actually over time trend if that coil is getting dirty by doing that. Lots of things, you, lots of neat things you can do, but you have to have a before and after. You've got to have something to compare to. Uh, if you did it on one model, and then you could actually apply that to other models too. There's some cool things you can do there. Not all manufacturers publish that sort of granular information on fan coils. They do on gas furnaces because the coil is a separate piece. It's a totally separate piece. Okay, so if, if all right. Had, if you had did before and after the filter, then you would have seen the pressure drop. Correct. Across, across that filter, right. right. What did you put it on? Where did it use the core range? Oh, Stick to in. to get underneath the coil, you mean, and above the coil? Usually, what I would do, honestly, is I would literally just take a because again, the uh, the whole probe thing, the position of the probe and all that, it's overrated. Like a lot of guys use ball needles; they'll take tiny, drill tiny little holes, or even sometimes screw holes. Um, Retrotech makes now a static pressure probe that's like that long and it's flexible, and you can literally take a screw out and it'll slide through. Um, does it make a difference? A little bit. But it's not enough for what we do for it to be a big deal. So what I would do if I was going to do it is I would literally just throw one on top of the coil, kind of get the panel on most way, and put one under the coil, and that would be enough for me. And you know, it's not, I don't over, don't overdo it. You may get 0.1 difference by how you position it, but it, for our purposes, it's not enough to matter that much. Um, but again, the point is, be com use common sense, make sure it's set up right in the first place. Verify static pressure, make sure that it's in range before you start adding charge is a best practice. Does, do I always do that? No, I have not, but it is helpful. Go ahead. Yeah, I probe for charge. So you need to check some, uh, maybe one, some guys know about it. You can see in the charge, especially the social pressure, right? You can see if you have restriction of the airflow or the pressure of the top. Mm-hmm. Or you can see if the pressure coming out, you have a most airflow but uh, two tones is the required. Sure. Right? So this is yeah, so again, like I'm not saying that you don't still also look at your readings on the charge side to help validate airflow, but it's that it's that which comes first thing, right? Like it's much easier to to set your charge if you know that your airflow is at least generally in range. Um, the other way around, there's a lot of things that can cause low suction pressure, right? Now, when we talk through troubleshooting, I'll cover more of this, so I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself. But, uh, but to your point, yes, you do use charge to help validate airflow as well. It is a both and type of situation, not either or. So, go ahead. Um, I don't know if this is common for you guys, but a lot of times my the equipment I buy, the furnace ships. It has a two ton, a three ton, a four ton, and a five ton blower motor. 
and the blower motor is set up for the air that number. So so even if I put if I put a four ton condenser on a five ton furnace, then I really have to make sure I go in. Like you can't expect the unit to come right. from the box. For me, set for four hundred fifty. Does that happen to you guys? Where you've got like a like the, like the yeah, a larger, uh, an up tonnage yeah. fan coil. And that's, and that's back to the original point I was making, that if you don't get that set up to begin with, um, then your static pressure is meaningless, right? You need to have that set up properly, otherwise your static pressure is going to look good if you don't have the right airflow to start with. Yeah, or really bad. Or really bad, right? If it's set too high, it'll look really bad, yeah. A lot of times we use it to like pop a ton bigger air handlers mm -hmm. sometimes, right? Or even between four and five times a ton bigger, you don't change it, you got way too much airflow. All right, and too much airflow in this market, very bad. Why? Why is too much airflow very bad? Doesn't dehumidify, right? And it, again, we want to drive down our saturated suction temperature. We want to drive down our coil temperature so that way we can get more dehumidification, right? And we have to try to manage our air handler sweating too. So it's a real tricky thing. Um, okay, so I will cover it now. Uh, we're going to cover it again. This is in my favorite. This is my favorite topic. One of my favorite topics, um, and I have lots of stories around this that I'll tell you of mistakes I've made. Um, but just to answer the question, in this market, I would definitely go for 350. Um, sometimes even as low as 325. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is that that's going to help the humidity in the space be better. Okay, so the space humidity is going to be better. But your air handler is going to want to sweat. Your ducts are going to want to sweat. Your vents are going to want to sweat. So it, it's tricky, right? If you increase airflow, what will happen is your air handler will be less likely to sweat in the attic, but your house will be more likely to be moldy and high humidity, right? So that's the trade-off. Lower airflow per ton, lower CFM per ton airflow results in better dehumidification in the space. Does that make sense? And so that's where. Sometimes you have to you have to make concessions, right? So if you're in an, if you're in a vented attic and you know that this particular brand of air handler you have is going to sweat like a pig, sometimes you may need to pump up the the um, uh, airflow, but then you may need to look at something like supplemental dehumidification or something else for the space so that it stays where it's supposed to be. It's always a it's always a trade-off. Would, would you design your ducting for 350 or 400? Well, it, it, again, if I, if I know for a fact that my air handler is not going to be a problem because it's in a closet, it's in, a, it's in the conditioned space, whatever, then I'm definitely going to design for 350. If it's going to be in the attic and I know that I'm going to have an issue, um, then I may design it for 400. But again, the other thing is designing your ductwork for is, is another, like, for you guys here, just make your ductwork bigger. If you're designing ductwork, make it bigger. Make it as big as you can make it and then use balancing dampers. Having too big of ductwork is not a real problem. That's, in fact, even in Manual D, which is the Bible for ductwork, it literally says at the end, um, it's like velocity really isn't an issue. Having too low a velocity really isn't a problem. Um, so basically, everything you just learned here, just put in bigger ducts. That's the answer. Um, it solves a lot of problems. Um, and then if you use balancing dampers, that's how they do it in commercial anyway. Commercial, they use eights and balancing dampers for everything. Like, it's very, very simple. Now again, for cost, obviously, you're not going to put, you know, right? You're not going to put a 12 to every bedroom. Like I, I get that, but you know, you know what on the edge is. Just don't go on the edge. Play, make it bigger if you have a choice, and use balancing dampers. Then that way you can set it however you want to set it. that too is even if you have, you using your friction rate, you design your duct system. It's not balanced, probably. Probably not balanced. You probably need to go and make some adjustments. Right. If you were a new construction shop where you did a bunch of new construction, okay, right? Because now 
it becomes a cost factor, right? Oversizing your ductwork all the time and space and all that stuff, it becomes more of a factor. But you're a retrofit shop, you're a change out shop. So you're gonna be doing ductwork, but it's gonna be in existing houses making it work, right? And when you're making it work, go bigger and do balancing dampers and just plan on a balance, you know, plan on going through. And even if your balance, you know, like, again, I, I want you to have an airflow hood, that's what I would prefer. Um, you actually design for that part. But even if you don't have an airflow hood and you just wanna use a vein anemometer and you just balance it based on the vein anemometer, like, hey, we're just gonna get the velocities very similar in all of these rooms, you're gonna be pretty good. Like, you're gonna be, pre it's better than nothing, it's pretty good, right? It's better than a handometer and it's better than nothing, right? It's better than what everyone else is doing uh, and you're gonna get pretty good results. And vein anemometers are really cheap. Like, you can, and you can put them on a selfie stick. Like, literally, get a selfie stick and a vein anemometer and now you're not setting airflow at that point, you're setting velocity. But again, if you design your, your grill similar and you, kinda, and you have a pretty good sense, if the velocities are all the same, you're probably gonna be in pretty good shape. And if you have a balancing damper, you can make some slight adjustments, you know, like, all right, you want a little, it's a master bedroom. Okay, give them a little more air. You know, open it up a little bit more, you know? Most of our restriction on the air is on the return side. Exactly, and there you go, right? So to your point, back to this, bigger returns at the equipment. Bigger filters at the equipment solve so much problems. Getting your ducts bigger at the unit and getting your filters bigger at the unit it is it just it pays for itself in spades and it's so much easier to do too. Like having to replace ducts all across the house. And again, that's the whole thing. A lot of people believe if you want to make airflow better, you have to replace everything. That's not true. Imagine, okay, here's the best example. How many of you have wells at your house where you get well water instead of city water? Anyone? No, not here? Okay, all right. Well, so where I live, I've got a well, and my well is far away from my house, okay? And it's in a pump house. And when I ran the water line, I was an idiot, and I made it too small, okay? So I want to get better water pressure to my house. I want to get better flow rate to my house. But I can't replace the entire line because part of it goes under my driveway, and it's going to be a big deal to do, right? So what can I do? Does it help? if I replace the line that I can replace with a bigger pipe. Does that help? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. A lot of people say, no, it doesn't, because it chokes down again, so it makes no difference. It does make a difference. So for example, if you have a duct and you know it's, too, it's a six, okay, and it, and it, but now it's going in between floors, or it's going somewhere you can't get to the end six feet of it. But it runs through the attic 30 feet. You could replace it with a nine or a 10 and adapt it down to the six right where you can and you will get more airflow out of the end of that duct. And sometimes we just don't, we, we are in pursuit of the perfect so we don't do the good uh, and we miss out on giving our clients good results. Does that make sense? And again, that's where balancing dampers come in really handy, oversizing ducts, bigger returns, bigger filters, you get great results out of that consistently. Because again, if you, and, and Matt will talk about this, if you are able to get a little budget by putting a bigger return in, now you can actually accept a little worse supply ducts because now your total external static is adding up those two, right? So you can, you can give a little take a little there in your design. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, hvacrschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications, available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.